Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which will feature the contents of this box. Uh, it was not sent to us for repair, but by a very generous uh, and kind viewer who thought that we might enjoy uh, checking out the contents and maybe making a video about it. So it looks like that's going to happen. Okay, I've already cut the tape. Let's get it open and see what's inside. Well, check this out. It's a 16-pound solid steel cabinet with a luggage-style handle painted in a kind of a pebble grain leather-colored industrial paint. There's a uh, tag riveted to the front door of the cabinet. Uh, very strangely, it was riveted upside down. Must have been an error at the factory because I can't imagine anyone drilling out the rivets and then putting it in upside down for fun. Uh, it also has one of those weird kind of latches. I remember when I was a kid my sisters had diaries with this type of a latch and of course that never kept me from reading their secrets but uh, kind of an uncommon uh, latch for an industrial grade piece of equipment. And lo and behold Looks like a microphone with some cable. And this is a Con Strobo tuner. Okay, this, uh, wow. Flat and sharp control. Probably a pilot light. Uh, gain uh, different keys A, B, C. Operate, calibrate. Power on off. I have a feeling I'm going to have to uh, download the instructions for this jewel. I've heard of these, but I've never seen one in person. Um, and the condition seems to be extraordinary. You know what? I'm very tempted to plug this into the current limiter and see if it will light up and maybe operate. Okay, let's uh, cross our fingers and try it out. Well, so far so good. I turned it on, put it in the operating mode. Um, haven't really picked a key here. And again, I'll just leave it 12 o'clock. But the little wheel started spinning, and I have a feeling this is going to work like those um, turntable calibration discs that when the turntable is exactly like 33 and a third, the strobe will cease to spin and will stop and remain a sort of constant and stable in the window. Uh, I'm tempted to get the signal generator and tune in specific frequencies that we know correlate to particular uh, keys like uh, A, B, C, things like that, those uh, specific notes. And um, see if this will stabilize. Okay, I'll uh, set that all up and be right back. Let's put our late 40s, early 50s uh, con a strobo tuner to the acid test using the signal generator and a modern guitar tuner to adjust to exactly the right frequency for each of the guitar strings. We'll plug that frequency in to the strobo tuner and see if it stabilizes the stroboscope. Okay, if indeed this is exactly E frequency, then the strobe should be frozen and should not be spinning. Okay, uh, we're going to start off then with the low E string, which has a fundamental uh, frequency of 82 cycles per second. So I'm right here at, uh, well, pretty close to 82 on the signal generator. Now bear in mind this knob is not all that accurate. It gives you a pretty close estimation. But we're going to rely on our guitar tuner here to verify that the frequencies that we're injecting into the strobo tuner are exactly correct. And they are. Okay, so let's unplug it from the uh, modern uh, tuner and plug it into the ancient tuner and see what happens. Well sure enough it's absolutely frozen uh, and that's with the flat and sharp adjustment 
at zero. You can use that to fine tune. If the image is moving, you can make it stop by adjusting the flatten sharp knob, but in this case, dead zero works quite well. So it appears that for the low E string, our um, Con Strobo Tuner is right exactly on the money. Now let's try the second string, the A string. A string is 110 hertz. We're at about 110 on the signal generator and our modern guitar tuner verifies that we are putting out exactly uh, the A frequency. Okay, let's plug it in to the strobo tuner and see what happens. Once again, it has stopped strobing. It is perfect. It appears then that the strobo tuner is exactly properly calibrated and accurate for the A string on the guitar. Now this was originally for piano tuning, but hey, a note's a note, okay? So um, I believe that's what the microphone was for, probably is to you set it on the piano. Um, okay, so now let's try the third string. The D string is 147. I moved the knob to the D string. Uh, had to go a little over on the signal generator, but we see that we're right on the money with the D frequency. Okay, let's plug it in and see what the strobo tuner says. Well, it's almost stable. Uh, let me go a tiny bit sharp. And when I say a tiny bit, it's frozen now. And, oh, what's that? Maybe one and a half or two degrees? Okay. Frozen. So almost right on the money. Okay, on the third string, the D string. Now let's go to the G string, which is 196. Okay, and always our favorite string. For G, let's try the fourth octave, uh, 784. And uh, you see that a little tiny bit higher than 784 on the signal generator, but that is right on the money for G. Okay, let's plug it in and see what the strobo tuner thinks. I turn the knob to G, and once again we're getting a tiny little bit of motion, which we can freeze. with almost a microscopic setting here on our sharp adjustment of almost identical to the previous um, string. It looks like about, what's that, about one and a half or two degrees. Okay, next will be the B string, um, and that'll be at 247. Tiny bit over on the signal generator, right on the money here uh, with our modern tuner. So now let's inject this frequency into the strobo tuner. Okay, our flat sharp is at zero and that looks pretty still to me. Um, I'm thinking that the Mighty Khan sounds like a Star Trek episode is right on the money as far as the B string frequency. Now to finish off, let's do the E string which is at 330 vibrations per second. Okay, 330. We're set a little high on the signal generator, about 350, but our modern tuner tells us, nope, we're right on the money for that high E string. Okay, I set the knob to the E string. We see that the strobe is holding steady. And we're, oh, maybe one or half degree flat. Okay, so it looks like the strobo tuner is beautifully calibrated and very accurate across all six guitar strings. Uh, very tiny little minor 
flat or sharp adjustments here. Um, and I don't know that you would be even be able to pick that up with your with your ear. Um, so uh, I pronounce this a fully functional and amazing ancient device. Okay, we need to take a look uh, inside at the tubes and, and chassis and also uh, maybe a look at the schematic so we can see how this jewel works. Well, you can't ask for anything much simpler than that. Undo two screws and it isn't just the back cover that comes off, it's the whole metal shroud. Okay, um, we'll take a look at the tube chart in just a minute, see what tubes are used, but here's the motor for our spinning disc. Here is that, looks like an adjustment a transformer uh, for our sharp and flat adjustment. Pilot light, filter caps, which seem to be working just fine. Uh, power transformer, which is a, a wee bit warm right now. Okay, it's kind of hot. Okay, uh, for some reason, we'll see this is a 6x5 uh, tube socket. There is no 6x5. So uh, let's take a look at the tube chart and see if any of these tubes sound familiar. 5879, 12AT7, 6X4 that is not plugged in, 6AQ5 twice, and a 12AU7. All these are fairly familiar tubes. Um, okay, I uh, will have to look at the schematic to see why this rectifier is not necessary because we just saw this thing works great as is. Okay, let me turn it over upside down and we'll take a look at the circuit. Well, the circuit has some very familiar looking components. Look at the blue molded caps. Um, I'm going to bet you that's a cathode bypass cap. Looks just like the ones they use in uh, Fender amps. Okay, it's pretty packed here. Fairly complex and everything seems to be working just fine. Very impressive. I noticed a calibration pot on this. I wonder if you can use that to maybe eliminate the need for the, the tiny little sharp and flat adjustments. Here's that calibration pot. This thing's so accurate right now, I'm not going to mess with it. Um, also, here are the flashing bulbs, and th they're flashing at the frequency of the input signal, and if that frequency is correct, then it will freeze the uh, strobe wheel and make the rectangles or little square boxes uh, quit spinning. Okay, it's, uh, notice that there's two sets of lights. Also, you notice on the uh, dial, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven octaves. Uh, mostly what we were looking at were fourth and uh, either fundamental or second octaves. So um, those are the lights then that are flashing behind this disc and that are freezing it. beautiful condition. Of course, uh, the fact it's all enclosed in that metal uh, case certainly helps. Aha! Uh -huh, here's why there's no 6x5 tube. Somebody has uh, substituted two diodes for the tube, so there's no need for it. Also, uh, even though these look like regular old uh, AC bulbs, uh, they're not. Uh, you can see how large the base is of each bulb. These are neon bulbs. You can't really see it on them, but there are any 48 bulbs. And God help you trying to find them. Uh, fortunately, both of these work. Well, I found a schematic for this jewel on the internet. It's the same one, uh, ST2. Let's just take a quick superficial look at the circuit so we can sort of get a general idea of how it works. Down here, it's simply an amplifier and one that guitar people will be familiar with. 
You got your signal input here uh, from the signal generator. Comes to the grid. This is a pentode. Uh, we're familiar with a 5879 uh, tube. It's a preamp tube. Puts out over here to uh, the uh, first triode of a 12AT7. Um, the output from the plate will come up this way to a selector switch and then it comes back down to the second triode and uh, exits from the plate and passes through the neon bulbs. Uh, over here the uh, 6x4 that's no longer needed is putting B plus in here or high voltage to go through the tubes and to flash them. The frequency of the sound in here has been amplified from our signal generator. This is at a, a very a much higher voltage than it was before. This frequency is rising and falling at exactly the same rate as the frequency of the input signal and then will pass the voltage through the neon bulbs so that they will flash at exactly the same rate as the input frequency. All this does is jack the voltage up enough so that it can illuminate the bulbs. Now when we look at the upper part of the schematic we see a second amplifier. Here we have a uh, triode of the 12AU7 acting as a phase inverter for the uh, two 6AQ5 uh, output tubes. They're in push-pull. Here is the output transformer that connects to their plates and as they push and pull they're sending a specific frequency electrical signal through the motor. The motor is a synchronous motor and it operates at the speed that is governed by the rate of the push-pull in the six AQ5s. Now here's the catch. Uh, the motor speed is not controlled by the frequency of the input signal. Otherwise it always agree. No, it's controlled over here by the particular note that you select right here with this knob. So the motor will be spinning at an exact rate uh, that correlates to each of the notes. It spins at a different rate for A, B, C, D, and such, and therefore as the motor is spinning the disc, that is the ideal speed, and if the input signal matches that ideal speed with the flashing of the neon lights, the little checkerboard on the uh, strobe disc will stop spinning. But if the input signal is of a slightly different frequency, it cannot stop the strobe disc uh, that's spinning at the ideal speed. So we have an amplifier up here that controls motor speed that is dictated by the position of this knob. And down here we have lights flashing at exactly the frequency of the input signal, which may or may not be correct. This motor is operating at the correct rate. Hopefully the flash rate will be exactly the same and the strobe will stop. Now just a quick final review of the chassis setup um, reflecting the schematic that we just saw. Okay, there is the power transformer, power transformer. Here are the uh, 5879 and the 12AT7 tubes that were used to control the rate of flashing of the neon bulbs. Neon bulbs are right in there. Here is the spinning disc. We know the speed of the motor is going to be controlled by the push-pull output from the 6AQ5s, which we see right here. And uh, I'm going to flip it over and we'll take a look at the output transformer that is actually controlling the motor. We flip it over and you might be tempted to think that's the output transformer, but it's not. This is, it's fairly small, okay, and it is uh, connected to the plates of the two uh, six AQ5s. This is this large inductor here that 
is controlled by the rotation of the uh, knob where we picked our keys A, B, C, D, E and all uh, as we rotated the switch. So it's going to have a whole bunch of wires connecting to the switch here that we use to select the key that we're trying to uh, determine the frequency of. Now finally, just for fun and, and to show you how the neon bulbs are working, I'm going to put in a 10 hertz signal. That's so slow that we can actually see the neon bulbs flashing. Now as I run the frequency up, you'll see they flash faster, faster, faster. Until finally, it looks like they're on continuously, but they aren't. Okay, they are flashing the whole time. Now I'll slow it back down. You'll see then that the neon bulbs do flash uh, in exact uh, accordance with the frequency of the input signal. Let's use this strobe to um, discuss something that's sort of interesting that you may or may not know about. Uh, right now we're at 10 Hertz, okay? 10 flashes per second. Our eye can easily distinguish that rate. You know those bulbs are flickering. Now I'm going to crank the frequency up. I can still see flickering, but we're going to crank it up until it appears to be a smooth, even light. Okay, we're seeing the wheel spin, but the light behind it seems pretty constant to me. And here's what's interesting. Uh, this is what determines the frame rate that television and movies are run at. Uh, they're flashing uh, frames at you on the screen at 24 flashes per second. Now as we see here things smoothed out at about 22 or 23. So at 24 flashes per second uh, what we see seems to be a fairly uniform image. Okay, but it's not. It's flashing. It's just flashing fast enough that it fools your eye. Uh, however, if you uh, have motion, like in a football game and somebody's running by the camera real fast, you'll see a blur. The reason for the blur is that it sort of reveals the relatively slow frame rate that the image is being uh, broadcast or uh, projected for you. That's the weakness of it. Uh, they've suggested moving the frame rate up to a higher, like 32 frames per second. Uh, it would cut down on eye strain if they did that, but uh, probably cost money, so don't bet on it, okay? But anyway, I just thought you might find that interesting. I wanted to show you one other feature of this unit, and it's something that you must do before you operate it, and that is the calibration mode. Now, when I push down on this button, See that box that's frozen at the uppermost arc? See how the box froze? Frozen. That means that the machine is calibrated and what you're using for the calibration is the 60 cycle AC uh, input signal. Okay, it's uh, using that. We know it's constant. It's always 60 cycles. So the machine is spinning the disk and flashing the lights in accordance with the 60 cycle AC uh, current supply. And uh, that's how we know that the machine is calibrated. And it is. If it weren't, then we could come up here and calibrate it with this knob. And once we get that calibrated, then we would go ahead and uh, do our testing of our different notes, knowing that they were being compared against a known constant 60 cycle frequency. Well, I guess that's about it on this relatively short and hopefully sweet video featuring the 1950 Con Strobotuner Model ST2. 
I thought you might enjoy a it's kind of change of pace video like this on uh, guitar related equipment. Uh, if I can find more such equipment, uh, we'll do this again in the future. And I hope you enjoyed it. Until then, I wanted to thank all of my uh, Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping us on the air uh, for another month. Uh, if you'd like to join them, I'll put links in the video description which will enable you to do so. I also wanted to thank the very generous viewer who sent us this final instrument so that I could demonstrate it for you in today's video. On a happy uh, Christmas note, I received notice from YouTube that I would indeed be receiving that 100,000 subscriber plaque. Uh, when it does get here, I will share the momentous opening with you in a future video. And on that happy note, uh, let me wish a Merry Christmas and holiday cheer to all of our uh, YouTube viewers. And I hope that you have a very safe and productive new year. See you in uh, 2022 and hopefully we'll have a bunch of great videos for you. See you then.